I'm Jessica Knoll, and I did Five Roses podcast, and I'm here with Brendan Keefe, our chief investigator at 11 Alive. He worked on the, the story with me, and we wanted to kind of wrap up some ideas we had with the podcast and the and the story itself and kind of talk up maybe about some of the most interesting aspects of some of the chapters that you've listened to what what did you think after listening to the the podcast for yourself what i was really left with was that feeling that of the third person you kept referring to that there's a third person involved in all of this and it's really the audience it's the people listening who might hold the answer what really struck me was that Everyone has a piece of the puzzle. Members of the task force have a piece of the puzzle. Uh, law enforcement, uh, you know, current and past, have a piece of the puzzle. Uh, you gathered up different pieces of the puzzle. We still don't have a picture yet. So the missing piece of the puzzle is in the hands of someone out there listening to this, and they can actually solve this more than a half century later. Did you get that feeling? Yeah, I mean, I, I've talked to you know several investigators in in all the cold cases that I've worked on, and you know they all tell me you know regardless of all this technology we have now and the DNA and things like that, that one of the you know the ways to solve and the most prevalent ways to solve a cold case, especially one of this long ago is from someone talking, um, someone knowing something and coming forward. So I, I definitely think that um, if either or both of these cases are going to be solved, they're going to be solved because someone finally comes forward and tells what they know. Yeah, it's one of those uh, quotes we've heard, and it's I think it's John Fedak who says it right. It says, if, uh, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. This whole idea that no one has talked uh, or at least no one talked to someone who then talked to someone, that how is it possible that for more than 50 years no one has said on their deathbed, it was me, or at least no one said that and it could be checked out? How do we still not know what happened to Mary Shotwell Little? How do we still not know who killed Diane Shields this many years later? You know, one of the things I think is kind of interesting is that people did talk. People did come forward. If you remember from a couple of the chapters, we talk about um, the the break in the case in 1994. They thought they had their, their ban. Um, and then uh, I don't want to give too many spoilers in case someone hasn't listened all the way through. But, you know, in Chapter 7, we have another uh, person come forward. Um, and then I have a long form digital piece that's going to come out soon um, that is a timeline. And it's going to include things that aren't in the podcast. And more people came forward. The problem is you can have all the evidence in the world and you can have people coming forward. But unless you have enough to convict, you can have a solved case that will still go unsolved forever if you don't have enough to close it. That's an important question. Do you think it solves? Do you think, do you have a, you know, suspect A in your head? I know you're the journalist here, but, you know, put on your subjective hat for one second and say, you know what, I think I know what happened to either both of these women or what happened to them individually. I will say I, I agree with a lot of partial theories. I don't know that I agree with any one theory that was mentioned in the podcast by the task force members. I tend to lean hard towards the chapter seven confession because there were just details that he knew that, sure, he could have been fed that information. But then again, then that leads me to believing part of the conspiracy theory that it was a massive cover up because if he was fed, who was he fed by? And what was his incentive to to confess to some, what? And I, I, I shouldn't say confess necessarily because it was more of an admission of mm -hmm. witnessing something. What I believe happened, and many people after chapter six changed their minds after listening to the profiler talk. Um, and I have to say, he got into my head too a little bit, but then I went back and I'm like, I don't know. I really feel like the two are connected. I feel like if one is solved, the other one will be close behind. I think that the profiler made a lot of really good, he came to a lot of good conclusions and, and, and made some really good and valid points, but there's a lot of coincidences and I have a hard time believing that many coincidences don't add up to something. One thing I do agree with with the profiler is that I don't necessarily believe it was the same assailant who hmm. um, is responsible for both women, but I tend to believe that 
whoever is behind all of it is the same. Right. So it doesn't have to be the same perpetrator, but at your the undercurrent of what you're saying is CNS Bank is the thing that connects the two of them. Oh, I'm not going to say that. No, and neither am I. It was a question. <laughs> but it, it is sort of the, the – it's the setting. If, if not – you know, co- uh, correlation is not causality. But the one thing we do have in common is the setting. And then you have this series of coincidences that you describe. And then in your Chapter 7 sort of admission of witnessing something, yeah, there's a lot of detail there. We either have, the, the, you know, a killer – or we have a really, really creative author of a fiction, you know, I mean, which of the two? Right. And, you know, I want to revise what I said before. It isn't that it isn't that no one's talked and isn't even that no one's essentially confessed. It's that everybody's talked and it hasn't added up to a solution. I mean, we've got, you know, some of the documents here are inches thick. The, the amount of investigative legwork that went into this before you ever picked up the case, before the task force ever picked up the case. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at all of the gumshoe investigation that was done by detectives and by police officers and the interviews and everybody they brought in and the photographs and evidence that was collected, some of which, much of which is now missing and, and is gone to history, that all of that adds up to question mark? Right. How is that possible? Right. And what and you know we we definitely get into in the podcast um, the evidence and the lack thereof and case files going missing and and brought back with you know s- still not the whole case file and I think um, you know Georgia law dictates that that police departments don't have to keep those files forever you know I think the mark is fifty years um, so they're they're clear to not have the case files as they once did um, but I will point out that in 1994 when the detective went back and said hey I want to look at these case file or I want to look at the evidence the evidence was already gone and I don't know what the time frame for that would be for the evidence because like you know 94 is not 50 years but what I will say is you know the amount of uh, paperwork that I went through I mean they there's a whole case file just on suspects. And they looked at nearly a thousand what they called sexual deviants for the Mary Shotwell Little case. Um, and I'm talking about the APD. Eventually, the FBI had taken the case. But, um, you know, even with all that, they, z- they still seemed to zero in on her husband, um, which I found interesting. Um, well, that's classic investigative casework, though, is you right. start in with concentric circles. The victim is the central point, and then you work out in concentric circles, and usually, you know, murder takes place by, you know, the victim and the assailant are known to each other. And so obviously that's where you're going to look. But, I mean, they obviously looked at this case so closely you know, if he was the perpetrator, this would have stopped a lot sooner, don't you think? I mean, or what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think um, he was a, um, kind of an abrasive person. I think that the, there, there was a distrust there from the beginning, so they didn't like him, uh, but they liked him for this this uh, case. Um, There's just nothing ever to really pinpoint for him. Um, but, you know, in the time that they were looking at him, did they miss something else is, right. is where my question would be. But then you, um, I want to go back to what you mentioned because we talked about this before, this, this sort of looking at a thousand sexual deviants. Mm. Other than the fact, you know, Mary's clothes are there and she's not, um, which leads you to believe she's naked somewhere, uh, there is no other evidence of a sexual assault. And certainly in the Diane Shields case, there's, you know, mm-hmm. and this is part of the problem, right, is that There was nothing stolen, and she also wasn't, you know, sexually assaulted, which leaves what are the possibilities left for a motive here? Um, So in Mary's case, I mean, her purse was gone, Mm -hmm. um, but as far as we know, it could be with her wherever she is. Um, She could have been wearing a raincoat because that was one of the items that wasn't left there. Well, if you're going to leave, if you're going to take her and then leave the clothes uh, and leave her somewhere, wouldn't you take the contents and leave the purse? Why take the whole purse? Right. I mean, this is what's so baffling about all of this is that we're, we're, 
we're left, every question leads to three more questions. Right, because you're saying that, and now I'm thinking of, well, you know, she was spotted in North Carolina with her credit card. Well, there's her purse. There's She's been spotted with a raincoat on in North Carolina. But then it's like, well, who took her there and why? And what did they end up doing with her there? And then why leave her car and her clothes with blood in Lenox Square? Why well, not? Yeah, and now you're leading to the actually the biggest, I think, overarching problem with this entire investigation is it relies almost entirely on witness testimony, mm. on witness recollections. And the one thing I noticed that is a thread through your entire podcast and through your entire investigation um, is that these recollections are often unreliable or you have conflicting uh, uh, recollections. And you've got that gas station attendant uh, who remembers with great detail something that happened weeks or months earlier uh, because of a credit card transaction. It just doesn't past the smell test uh, that you would have that kind of level of detail, but it, you know, it disturbed you, but not enough to pick up the phone, right. not to call the police. Exactly. And so every one of these little vignettes, I mean, you, I don't know about you, but w- because obviously it was your podcast and you're the one speaking it, but while I'm listening, the great thing about podcasts is you're visualizing yourself. It's sort of like the next best thing to reading a book because you create the the scenes in your mind. and. I'm I'm seeing, you know, a rainy gas station and I'm seeing, you know, 1965 and I'm seeing the gas station attendant looking through thick glasses and and being concerned about this blood covered woman. I but mean, he doesn't call anyone. Right, but he doesn't, right. is it covered in blood or is it splattered? I mean, we ah, I mean we and um but it it's you almost want to reach back in time and rescue both of them. That that we know the ending. We, it's it's like um, the old movie Memento, you know, mm-hmm. where every it's done in reverse order. We know the ending, and we're trying to get back to the beginning, but we're piecing it together with such limited information that it's frustrating. The thing is that that Diane and Mary didn't know the ending, but they know the rest of the chapters, mm-hmm. and it's so frustrating that we can't, you know, we can't help answer that for them. Do you think they're ever going to get justice? I guess it depends on your definition, Um, because like I said earlier, you know, um, and I think families will tell you there's no such thing as closure. Um, Mm. And I I tend to not use that word when speaking to families when they have a cold case. But um, as far as justice goes, I guess most people would think justice is a conviction um, and that person paying for their crime. But in this case, justice could also be closing it and finding out, just having the answers, finding out what happened to them. So even if the killer or killers are dead or is dead, then um, that's, if we can just simply answer what happened and who did it, or either of those questions, right. that's enough. I'm not one to answer if that's enough. I think, um, I think it would be the end of questions. I think right. if, 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 uh, if, you know, one of these um, one of these bodies or remains that have been found in and around Atlanta, mm-hmm. um, you know, or anywhere in the southeast. If one of those turns out to be Mary, um, is that enough? Just to say, all right, now we know right. what happened to her, at least to the point of she was killed and, and buried wherever that is? Or or do we need to know specifics? Do we need to know exactly how she died? Who put her there? Why they put her there? Um, you know, I think to me, justice would be finding out all those answers. Um, it doesn't mean that there's going to be a conviction. I highly doubt there'll be a conviction ever for either. Um, but I think finding out the answers, um, the who and the why, which are the hardest to answer um, in these cases, um, would bring them justice. Yeah, isn't it amazing if this had happened, if this, if these two incidents had happened, these two, I guess we can call them both murders, even though Mary hasn't been found, it's pretty clear what happened to her. Um, but in these two murders, had they happened today, there would have been surveillance video from Lenox Square. There would have been surveillance video in East Point. There would have been bank surveillance 
uh, uh, video. You know, back then it was a still photograph that was triggered only when there was a robbery. You know, I mean, this, I mean, the amount of forensics, um, you know, pretty much it was fingerprints and they, you know, the serology blood was basically just typing mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. Um, there was no real um, forensics. It was gumshoe. It was wit witness testimony. It was that kind of thing. Whereas now, you know, it's amazing we even have the credit card receipt, for example, or that kind of tracking because... In 1965 and, and in 67, there was no, um, you weren't on the grid like you are now. Yeah. Uh, we, we carry around a tracking device in our pocket, a phone, that is constantly pinging a cell tower. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that we wouldn't be able to pinpoint exactly when and where things occurred, um, it, it, does that strike you at all is the difference between then and now that yeah. it, it seems so recent it's, I was born in 1968 it seems recent but at the same time it's it's another world yeah and I think um, that's a really good point because at least in Diane's case I think that would have answered a lot of questions up front because um, she was well known for going off and doing her own thing and not telling anyone where she was going when she was going to be back um, you know we had talked to John Fedact, and um, she was telling people that she was somehow investigating or had a hand in Mary Shotwell Little's disappearance. That's the one that strikes me so it's much. It's so bizarre. Because this idea that, I mean, everyone seems to be on the same page that she was just given a business card by an investigator and, you know, if you know anything, let me know. And she kind of deputized herself to be part of the investigation. And whether she actually did any real investigating or not, uh, that really is a strong motive. Mm -hmm. uh, because you always kind of want to look for a motive. Why did someone kill this person? And then work back way, backwards from there to say, who would that person uh, be that would fit the why? And in this case... Um, with man, that really strikes me. This whole idea of well, it I'm totally connects the two. It I does. mean, it does because well, the other thing is you have to believe in coincidences. And as an investigative reporter, I don't believe in coincidences, but I also interrogate my own facts. If I, you know, am I going to look at that and say, is it possible it's a coincidence? Of course, it's possible. But yeah, it's hey everybody. Uh, by the way, I'm the you know the police department has asked me to look into this, and I'm I'm investigating. Um, and then, oh, by the way, here some roses show up. I mean, it's really, it's really stunning. Let me ask you, when you were starting this investigation and this podcast, what is it you were hoping to discover and achieve? And, and did you discover and achieve those things? Hmm. My goal at the beginning was um, to tell Mary and Diane's stories. Um, to tell it from the beginning and then to the end and, and figure out, um, is there anything in there that someone's missing? Um, is there that nugget that everyone has kind of glossed over that, that, you know, someone on the podcast is listening to and they're like, well, wait a minute. Um, well, did you have a, any of those wait a minute moments? Was there a nugget that, that, I mean, maybe was known, but not widely known that, that made you sit up and say, wow. I mean, there were a couple of wows. You came to me as you discovered something. Yeah, there was like, a lot of what I just discovered this, and you you sort of uh, released it in the podcast in a similar way, so that you know everybody. I started like everybody did. Oh, these these two cases are definitely connected. Oh wait, now maybe they're not, mm -hmm. um, or or the same killer at least. Um, it's and then now you have to believe there's two killers out there. You know, stalking women in the mid to late '60s in metro atlanta which yeah. was obviously a different place back then there was a lot that i read and and a lot that was like wow that that can't be a coincidence one of the things that just always struck with me though is the confession yeah and things there's a, and, and there's a lot of detail in that about you know how they found her and where they drove and all of this kind of stuff but but i still am stuck with who in the world would bring the car back i don't get why does this car make this or the folded up clothes all of it the, but no there's none of it makes any sense but if you're going to go through the trouble of you know kidnapping someone taking them to north carolina um and then why bring the car back to exactly the same spot it's not as though not to mention it's going to be noticed as the lone car out in the parking lot i mean this doesn't not not to mention you expose yourself because maybe that was 
or was it the a purpose. message? Was it a that message was like purpose. like Diane was a message because you just don't leave car. a body like that, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to think um, if we can't in, envision like why would someone do this? Maybe that's the reason. There is no reason other than here it is. Now you know that the, the job has been done or... It's like the roses. It's like, the, you know, uh, the roses they're all messages. The, the bank is the setting. The roses are a message. The car could be a message. And the cars were both definitely vehicles, figuratively and literally, mm -hmm. for murder. Or yeah. we believe murder. Now, the question I had with the confession, and John Fedak and I had, had kind of gone back and forth on this. It's like, why would they take her, kidnap her, hold her hostage do what they're going to do, and then bring her back to Atlanta. It doesn't make any it sense. It makes no sense. And then just decide halfway there that, oh, nope, we're going we're gonna to take care of you right now. And, and then bury her in Atlanta. Yeah, it doesn't – it's really, really troubling. Let me ask you, um, because this is one thing you can answer that I can't. You are a woman, a young woman, uh, not exactly – uh, fitting the exact demographics of, of the victims in this case. But they were young women in Atlanta following their careers and limited opportunities in that time, which you cover really well. There's a great setting of or sort of feel for why young women were coming to Atlanta, the kind of jobs they could get, that this, you know, and they would have to live with roommates, even sometimes the same roommate, <laughs> which is just another bizarre coincidence. Um, but what was what was your feeling as a woman standing there against that chain link fence that was once the dry cleaners parking lot uh, where Diane was found or walking the parking lot at Lenox Square uh, and the very ground upon which Mary Shotwell Little was kidnapped? Um, what, what did it feel like as a woman in that situation, hmm. even separated by time? You were in the same places. As a, as a woman, at, but, you know, separated by half a century. Their cases, first of all, are kind of the basis as to why we're all so cautious today. Mm. Um, it started then in Atlanta. Um, and, you know, we're in the news business, and we see even more than the average person does on TV. Right. And what they see on TV is always crime, crime, crime. So it puts you on edge. But we see even more. So it's like, I think standing in those in those places, it's um, for me, it helps to tell their story better mm -hmm. because that's not necessarily the last place they were alive. In fact, I don't believe that either of them were necessarily killed in those locations. Mm -hmm. But it's. It's uh, it's the last clue. It's the last breadcrumb that they left um, that we know of, mm -hmm. aside from gas station receipts or anything else that you think of. But for sure, definitively, because we don't know that those gas station receipts were really her signature or True. that was really her in the right. car. But definitively, we know that their cars are their last pieces of evidence. So to be where those cars sat mm -hmm. more than 50 years ago, um, it helps – um, to understand their story better, to understand the location and, um, you know, where they were at those times, you know, especially with Mary, you know, Lennox looks completely different now than it does in pictures from 1965. Um, but it was interesting to see, okay, this is, we know she was parked over here and um, she had dinner over here. She had to walk across the parking lot to here. Um, and what that's like as a woman, um, and you got to think, what's well, October at 8, 8 o'clock? It's probably dark already. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Atlanta then was so much more innocent. So mm -hmm. she probably wasn't necessarily looking over her shoulder. Mm. Um, for someone like me, I'm very aware of my surroundings. Um, and so I think... Um, it, it's just interesting to see um, more than just in photos or, or anything like that, like to really go there and to understand um, what it would have been like for her there. Yeah, it wasn't so much a more innocent time. It was people believed it was. Sure. And yeah. so this is sort of like when well, you Right, look, this was the underbelly. This was like the exactly. reveal of the underbelly and the underworld of Atlanta that no one 
either knew or wanted to know right. existed. Well, like the good old days when you talk about like, you know, sort of beaver cleaver and all of that. Um, you know, I'm the youngest of nine kids. So basically my older siblings were raised in sort of that time frame um, and, you know, born in the 50s and into the early 60s. And the thing is, though, not in my family, but certainly in the families we knew, that perfectly manicured lawn and that happy, smiling husband and wife, um, you know, he was beating the, the husband was beating the wife. He was cheating on her. The, uh, the priest may or may not have been a good uh, person down at the local church. Uh, you know, your kid was an altar boy. What was happening there? Right. Um, you know, people talk about the good old days, but the only thing is, is this was happening behind closed doors, behind a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the New York area where Aton Pates was, uh, was kidnapped and murdered, and only recently was that cold case solved. He was the first milk kit, carton kid where they put his picture on the side of the milk carton. And I remember the change where I wasn't allowed to go outside the house and play in the street without telling my mother where I was going and what I was doing. But before that, I could. But Aton was in that same situation. Mary was in that same mm -hmm. situation. Diane, you could argue, at least had the fair warning that women were being, you know, kidnapped on the street um, outside a shopping center. Uh, I know certainly people were acting, people in the city were very concerned after Mary shot Will Little. Mm -hmm. But then after Diane, and I still don't get the sense, I do, I do need to ask you this, do, was there an understanding at the time that these two cases might be connected or did no one see that at the time it's my understanding that no one saw it that way no, no one how could no how, how could not the well, other women at the cns bank go another one i mean like if i got kidnapped and disappeared you know and then 18 mm -hmm. months later you know andy parati who's sitting at you know in the same area as i do you know ends up murdered how do you not go gee that what a coincidence right <laughs> I, I don't know that there is there is a lot of chatter between departments because you got to think this is Atlanta Police Department and East Point Police Department. Well, how about the roommate? What's her name again? Uh, Judy Brownlee. Yeah, Judy Brownlee, and and, well, and I know she's still you know, I don't know walking there, the earth, but I, I I don't know that there was any love loss when um, they split as roommates. I see. So I don't know that there was still that. Um, uh, I don't know if there if if she would have put two and two together either, and you got to remember. That while they both worked at CNS Bank, when Diane mm -hmm. disappeared and then was murdered, she was actually already working at That's another right. job she at left. AIG. That's so maybe the bank wouldn't put two and two together because I don't That's think a good Di point. Diane didn't really work there point. very long. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Judy Brownlee would be one of the people I would think that would kind of piece the two together. But I do know in talking to the task force, um, and as people who've listened to the podcast know, um, several of the task force members investigated this case at some point uh, before the task force was formed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there's one gentleman who was an East Point detective. Mm -hmm. He even went to the FBI to get information, and they were very um, tight-lipped, would not give information. Um, he had spoken to other detectives, and uh, when he broached the subject of, I think this, these are two connected cases, mm -hmm. no, they're not. That's it. Right. That was all I got, that they weren't. Well, did you get any emails or other communications from people who've listened to the podcast where they have proposed something that piqued your interest? Yeah, definitely. And I'm uh, actually going to meet with at least one of them um, soon. Um, and I won't go into detail because obviously, just like a lot of information in Five Roses, everything, a lot of things have to be vetted and figured out what mm -hmm. can be used. Um, but she has a very interesting story. Um, and um, I will give a very brief synopsis um, that won't include names, obviously. But um, she has a relative who has since uh, died. Um, but he was convicted of a um, rape and murder, rape, murder, kidnapping, uh, burglary mm -hmm. uh, of a woman. And in I want to say 1970 um, so he would have been around the right age um, to also be in Atlanta um, again you know we don't know that you know Mary may or may not have been sexually assaulted we don't know because she's nowhere to know. be found right. um, Diane was not sexually assaulted um, 
But as far as Mary goes, I mean, he could fit into one of those thousand of sexual deviants that they had looked at. And that's one of the things is looking through that suspect file and see if um, if they looked at him. Now, he uh, was convicted with through another agency. So APD may not had a radar on him. Um, um, I'm not sure. I have to look through all mm-hmm. those uh, names that they have listed. Um, but she thinks her relative. She thinks it's a good possibility that that he was somehow involved. Um, and so it's it's definitely something that I want to follow up with uh, Atlanta police um, to find out if you know there's any connection uh with him if he was even looked at um my guess is it's it's going to be in the file that i have if they did um but um well they looked at half the city too i mean (laughs) they did and well the, the one of the issues is and and is I don't have all the files, mm-hmm. and I don't have all the FBI files. There's a whole other room full of files from what I've been told with the FBI that are sealed off. What I have from the FBI is through the APD that right. they were able to get from the FBI. So, um, And so there's all these puzzle pieces that are still missing, even for the task force members. Um, I don't know that I have everything that they have, and I don't think that they have everything I have. There were some things that... Um, Even Susan Carpenter, you know, who Mm -hmm. I would think had one of the biggest collections of these case files. Um, I don't think that she had everything that I most recently got. So um, I think even if he were looked at, it may not be in the files that I have. So who knows? It's an interesting look, though. Um, I was looking a little bit at his stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll see if anything kind of matches up. Um, problem is the reason I've said is that I don't believe there will ever be a conviction is we have no forensic evidence to test anymore. You know, we have photos of fingerprints, but as far as I know, we don't have the fingerprint cards anymore. Um, the, the blood that we had no longer there, the clothing that was, you know, taken, I don't know that that exists anymore. Everything that I've heard of that could be tested against someone like, you know, her relative um, no longer exists. So how do you, you know, prove to anyone without that information now? Right. And then the other point you brought up is that different jurisdictions have pieces of the puzzle and, and they talk to each other more now, but not even enough in a lot of cases. Um, you know, the one thing that's consistent in, in so many of these cold cases is that um, police and governments respect the borders and the sort of invisible city and county lines. But the killers are, are liminal figures who are able to straddle those lines and are able to cross them freely. And in fact, often and do, do so, so purposefully, exactly to evade capture. Samuel Little, who recently confessed to multiple cases that have been confirmed across the country, will likely be confirmed as the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. Uh, he was a child when this would have happened, or close to a child when this would have happened, or at least not active enough to have been involved. Certainly not a suspect. But the point, I, the reason I bring him up is that he was the worst kind of serial killer because he was a traveling serial killer who had no problem being in one city today and another city tomorrow. But even in Metro Atlanta, uh, you know, where we're recording this in the city of Atlanta, we are barely a mile from DeKalb County, not even. So we could very quickly be in another jurisdiction Mm -hmm. uh, in in a matter of of minutes, um, very, very quickly. And even back then, you could be in different jurisdictions. You could be in North Carolina and back the next day with a car, uh, back, you know, virtually where it started. Um, and is that troubling? Because you have this, um, the, this sort of, it's asymmetric warfare, isn't it? Where police are confined to an area and the killer isn't. Right. I mean, and, and we come across that with you know all the cold cases that we look at and you know we came across that you and i with the the hunt series that we did with the serial killers um and it's 
it makes it difficult, I imagine, not just, you know, the investigators who are looking into this, but then when we try to tell the story, um, you know, you have half stories because, you know, there's uh, the one case that, that I've worked on that actually span over three different jurisdictions mm-hmm. and the GBI was involved. So we had three different counties, the GBI, and that particular case, like no one had all the information. So it made it difficult to zero in on um, the information that we needed and the the interviews that we needed. So I can't imagine what it's like for investigators who um, kind of have to stay in, like you said, inside that vis- invisible line. Um, and I, I think if there was more I mean, APD and East Point are like Mm -hmm. backyard neighbors are right next to each other. It's like if they just would have talked in 1967. Right. Would we be sitting here talking about this? But there are even two different police departments today. I mean, wouldn't you say the level of access you got at one was much, much greater than the level of access you initially got at the other? Absolutely. So here you are. I mean, granted, I guess, you know, these days, uh, especially, you know, given the work that I do, they're very suspicious when we start poking around. But you are willing to put in your sweat equity to try to solve these cases, why wouldn't they throw open the doors to you? Frankly, East Point, I think, did, wouldn't mm-hmm. you say? I think so, yeah. But Atlanta police was like, okay, here's how much it's going to cost, and you know, we can't let you see the photographs, and no, you can't take pictures, and, you know, the, on a case that it certainly isn't being actively investigated by any, there isn't a detective with this case on their, uh, this case file on their desk. This, Not they that I'm to, aware of. They had to go to the deep archive mm-hmm. to pull this out, and, um, and I mean, it's amazing how many detectives have gone to their grave not solving this case. Absolutely. There are people who have started as rookies hearing about this case, uh, like your, um, the, uh, the officer in East Point. He wasn't even, when Diane Shields was murdered, he was driving by as a civilian, as a high schooler. Oh, um, yeah, right. And, right. And, and, you know, basically. We got Bob Matthews. Bob Matthews, mm-hmm. thanks. Driving by and remembers oh my, that, that, I drove by that night. Then he's a rookie police officer and starts looking into it. Now he's a retiree and it's still not solved. So you, the span of time we're talking about here, I think it's amazing that there were still witness statements and testimony yeah. and all of this that was still available, that was still, um, you know, that, that a lot of the things you were able to look at were still accessible. Right. And yeah, don't get me wrong. I think that the the amount of information that I was able to obtain from the two departments is extraordinary, especially in cold cases. A lot of times um, it's hard to get that much information um, from a department. And so there was this abundance. And it, the reason I pick on the things that weren't there, the pieces that are missing, is because that's what the task force um, is looking at. They're looking at all these pieces that you know, they've been looking at this for a better part of a decade. So they already know everything I already read through. It's all that missing stuff they want to find. It's all that missing stuff that now it's like, oh, man, if we had this, maybe it would, you know, solve a part of this that we're looking at. But um, looking, reading through the the witness statements and, and different things was, it was definitely like going back in time and, and, I think even more so than going to the scenes, which I always like to go to the scenes, but reading through all those case files, it was like I was transported into the 60s. I mean, people talk differently and um, things are just, um, uh, interviews were very different then. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, there was a lot of information. Weren't you impressed Mm -hmm. by the depth of the investigations? I mean, when I looked through some of the case file, and I haven't looked as as case files, plural, I haven't looked through nearly as much as you have, but this was thorough work. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, the, the men and now men and women who've worked on this case have put forth you know, tens of thousands of, of hours and, and were very meticulous in their, you know, turning every stone over and questioning every person. And I mean, were you just impressed by that? Because I don't even think we see that level of gumshoe investigation today I on really, anything. I really, I, I was impressed. Um, and, and 
I'm not going to say whether or not I think that that amount is going into today, but I think maybe today we rely a lot more on things like DNA and fingerprints. Well, and that's that, why. You so don't, we don't have to rely exactly. on all the witnesses. Were there any theories that you have dismissed out of hand, or do you are, remain open about all of them? I mean, you know, the love shack and the, you know, the swingers and the, I mean, there were so many, there's so many, I guess that's the problem is, well, by definition, some of these have to be, many of these have to be dead ends, excuse the, the unintended pun, but it's like you don't, you know, because there's so many of these, every investigator who picks this up, it's like a, it's like a comedy of errors because you have to just keep going down these possible dead rabbit ends. Holes. It is rabbit holes. Yeah. How do you... Well, and Did you find yourself doing that? Like, oh, mate, this is it. This yes, is it. Every single so time. So it is like a grail quest. It, it is, is. You know, Danny Egan's right. It's like because the, the, the grail quests, you know, of, of Arthurian legend almost always ended in some sort of, you know, death or dismemberment or something right. of the person seeking it. I mean, it's so it the, becomes an obsession and, and that onto itself. Yeah, and, and it was like, uh, as John Fiedek puts it, the best way possible. It's like an onion with all these layers. Right. And every time you go down one route, you think you're headed there, and then it takes a sharp left. And that happened to me, even though I knew that going into it, it's still, ever when I was reading through the files, it was like, oh, I think this person knows something. I think this person is, yeah, this has got to be the person. And then you'd read something else, and you're like, well, no, that wouldn't make sense with them. And I think all those, you know, different theories with the the love shack and um, the money at the bank and just little, you know, everything that um, that is discussed in the theories, I had to look at it, and I'm like, well, would that be motive? Yeah. Would that be motive? Yeah. So all the things that that is brought up by the task force and, mm-hmm. and also the way that the questions were phrased for by the detectives in the case files, you can tell what they've been told by others because they start questioning in that way to the other witnesses or the ones closest to those um, two women. And so then you start to get in with the detective and you're like, all right, he's asking this. Why is he asking that? Is he going right. to get somewhere with this? And then you get to the end of the report and it's like, well, he didn't get anywhere with it. Right. So you have to get to the next one and see if any. So you're almost it's almost like you're taking this journey with the detective who went through months and months of interviews with these people um, trying to grasp onto a thread of what really happened. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, and maybe we can wrap it up here. Is this going to be the case like like it has been for almost every investigator who's touched this case? It has been the one that haunts them or at least the one that sticks with them. Everybody we talk to, this is their the, the case that it wasn't the job. Is this case part of your job or do you think this is the one that's going to stick with you? I know you've looked in a lot of them. Are you going to stop or is this always... Are you always going to be living with Diane Shields and Mary Shotwell Little? Um, I think after looking at it as closely and as long as I have, it would be impossible not to always have Mary and Diane in my head. I think that Diane and Mary are going to haunt everyone who listens to this podcast because their stories are everyone's stories. I think that this could happen to anyone. Well, that's who you relate with in the story, right? I mean, you know, uh, any good prosecutor or defense attorney wants you to relate to who the, you know, the prosecutor wants you to relate as a juror to the victim, and the defense attorney wants you to relate as a juror to the defendant. Um, you know, in every story we watch, every movie, every book, every, every article, you're you're always looking for that person who's, who's most like me. Mm-hmm. And I think that... Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're all Diane, aren't we? And we're all Mary. We're all getting out, having just shopped for groceries and, and, and getting into our car at the shopping center. We're all, you know, going out after work. And the idea that you could vanish in one case and, you know, have your blood-covered car dumped with your neatly folded clothing back where you were abducted uh, or stuffed in your own trunk. The This is the... the the part that we're all just one decision away uh, by no fault of our own, of our demise at the hands of someone else, right? Right, absolutely. Not to scare everyone, 
but... Well, you're the one who's going around <laughs> telling everyone you're investigating the Mary Shotwell Little case. Well, this is true. And this is not have a very good track record. I mean, I think that's that's the thing, um, is, is it's the not knowing, isn't it? It's the not knowing what happened. Um, even though we know what happened to Diane, we don't know why or who. And in the case of Mary, we don't know why, who, or really what, mm-hmm. uh, or and certainly where. And that leaves so many open questions, and we may never know the answer. And and we'll be the we'll be the Bobs and the and the Dannys uh, retired someday, going well. We weren't able to solve that one. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, someone out there listening to this right now has the answers. I I think that that is going to be um, Diane and Mary's best hope, is that the the third person is going to be listening and and have the courage to come forward five roses is produced narrated and reported by jessica knoll and produced by joe flacari philip kish is the digital director and aaron peterson is the executive producer brendan keefe is our tv investigator joshua coates created the graphic and a special thanks to annie campbell Five Roses is produced for WXIA-TV, 11alive.com, and Tegna Media as part of our ongoing digital series, Gone Cold. We're on Twitter and Instagram as Gone Cold, and we have a Facebook group page you can join and discuss the podcast and other cold cases. You can read about more cold cases and listen to our upcoming monthly podcast by visiting 11alive.com backslash gone cold. <laughs>